Hello. Hey. Well, we wanted to start with a cold open to let you know that we're going to do a Halloween episode. Ooh, spooky. (laughs) I'm so excited. So we hope you'll join us on the 31st. Yes. Yes. It'll be a kind of a two-part episode. All in in one one episode. In one episode. Something kind of spooky. Halloween related. And one more true crime related. Yes. I'm super excited. Awesome. So if you join us then... You'll also get to hear the winner of our giveaway. We're extending the giveaway. Yes, because we have a special episode where we're like, why don't we just extend it? And then it gives our listeners more opportunity to tell their friends and to go enter the giveaway. It's on our Instagram and I think on our Facebook page. Facebook, yep. Facebook you can enter Instagram. the giveaway under either post in that way. Absolutely. So remember, if you rate us on Spotify, Apple, especially. Yes. Please let us know. I saw some ratings and we have no idea who you are because they don't take your name. So if you rate us, let us know. Even if you leave a review, but your username for that review is different than your actual name, let Let us us know know, because that earns you an entry. Absolutely. As well as tag your friends, tell your friends. Read all the rules, though. Yes. It's a lot to talk about now. Everything is outlined (laughs) on the post. Yes. And we're super excited to bring you a Halloween special. Absolutely. Thanks yeah. for listening. Yeah, let's get into the case. Sounds good. Nobody jams out harder to our own intro than me. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Hey. Hi. I've missed you this week. I know. I haven't seen you. I know. I miss everyone. Well, I miss miss you. (laughs) I'm Savannah. I'm Alicia. This is Burden of Proof. Welcome. Disclaimer, I'm allergic to the world. So if I sound kind of gross, that's why. Yeah. Sorry, my backup co-host is non-existent so i was gonna say who in the world are you, you trying guys, to replace you, me with <laughs> nobody 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 can replace you no i'm too weird <laughs> all right are you ready for this i'm not sure but i am going completely I'm blind today because usually i feel like you usually know cases that i'm like i've kind of heard or i yeah. don't re- fully remember and I found this case, and while it's not our typical, I don't know what <laughs> word to fill in there. I'm sorry. The words are, are escaping me. It's not our typical case. It's because there's not a lot with the trials, Yeah. which I don't want to give too much away up front, but there's not a lot of trial stuff, but it was just so fascinating to me, and because we've kind of been on this kick with like mental health issues and stuff. Yeah. I was very fascinated by it. So, here we go. Buckle it up. Buckle it <laughs> Buckle up. It's the case of Pazuzu Algarod. Pazuzu. Pazuzu. <laughs> All right. So, Pazuzu was born in San Francisco, California. Actually, as, spoiler, Pazuzu was not his given name. <laughs> oh, his parents did kind of love him. Yeah. And they no, didn't his name parents him Pazuzu. Were, maybe, I won't say his parents are normal. Actually, we don't know much about his dad. But um, his, I wouldn't call his mom completely, you know, normal. But, yeah, no, she didn't name her son Pazuzu. Okay. I feel a little <laughs> bit better about this now. His name was actually John Alexander Lawson. That's and such a normal name. Yeah. And he was born... Some sources say August 12th, 1978. Some say December of 1978. That's very different. I I don't know. That's one of my the things that will forever frustrate me in researching these cases is how do you get something like a birth date wrong? I don't know. When you're like really digging deep. I mean, I get how like... Yeah, I don't know. You know, when you're doing like podcast research, you're researching, but you're on a time limit like you're not doing an in like yeah this isn't a thesis 
in-depth like background search on yeah. people you're using other people's research to, uh, for the most part or court records so again i i apologize if august 12th is not right I, i'm going with that because there were more sources that said that than yeah. december so not that any of that matters the main thing is he was born in 1978 does matter we don't know what his sign is <laughs> Well, yeah, I thought about that, too. I don't know where to go. And I thought, um, isn't August 12th a Leo? I think so. I think August 12th is Leo. Yeah. And that would make more sense to me than December 8th, given okay. given this. So I chose it for you. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I have anything against Leos. I don't. No. But you just talk about, like, they can be chaotic, right? A yeah. A little bit. A little bit. A little bit chaotic. All right. So his parents had a rocky relationship from the start. And when John was just five years old, his mother moved her, them, him and her, moved to her hometown of Clemens, North Carolina, which is a suburb of Winston-Salem. I know where that is. Yes. I'm from Shaw. So you might have. I was a little surprised that you hadn't heard about this case because it is so close to where you used to live. So, Winston-Salem and surrounding areas were dominated by tobacco farming and the cigarette industry for decades. Just to give a little little picture of what we're looking at, the type of town we're looking at. It was once a town that made it possible to make a decent living with just a high school diploma, but by the early 2000s, it was actually home to a lot of desperate people, many who feel they have no purpose or meaning and they feel like what can i do here i don't have the money to get out but i can't make a living like you know my parents and grandparents did so unfortunately like so many other towns across this country a lot of people a lot of young people turn to drugs despite that it actually is still a town you you are all too familiar. That's in the Bible Belt. Oh yes, predominantly Christian. You know that God fearing and church going Christian town. So, John didn't quite fit into that narrative. <laughs> I'll just say a man who named himself Pazuzu. Pazuzu. I, <laughs> yeah. She said earlier the only thing I know about this case is that he didn't na- that he named himself Pazuzu. I said so. This is a cult because I feel like nine times out of ten, when somebody's naming themselves, it's because they're in a cult. Yeah. Well, if we were like really speculating on the matter, if it had continued longer than it did, I think it would be safe to say he was sort of attempting to okay, to create a cult. He's cult adjacent. More so, yeah, it's more so like a Charlie's Charlie Manson wannabe situation. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. I I know where we're at now. Yeah. Okay. So, when he was young, some family friends talked about were interviewed and they talked about when he was young and how he had a fascination with like a lot of dark things from a young age like just things that but not things you know we're not talking like Dahmer like played with animal bones and carcasses dark we're just talking horror movies vampires that sort of thing so but he was fairly young so some people especially in a town like that they thought that was strange but his mom let him do it because she's like well what's the harm like he's happy what's the big deal there's some report that says when he was as young as like eight or nine years old there was some issues with his mental health but it really started to spiral when he was about 13 14 years old entering high school that tracks so it that also coincides with the age he was when he lost contact or stopped contacting his father. So, alrighty, we don't know that that's an exact correlation, but I found that interesting. So he was reportedly hospital hospitalized and treated at various times throughout his life, beginning around the time of thirteen years, and was diagnosed with agoraphobia schizophrenia and manic depression that's kind of big diagnosis for a 13 year old yes it was also around that time that he began drinking heavily and using recreational drugs 
And in one of his psych evals, he claimed that the alcohol calmed him down. We love self-medicating. Yes. Interesting fact. John went on to repeat ninth grade multiple times before dropping out at the age of 18. Oh. Yeah. That's rough. So he, he did not... He didn't do well. He had friends, but not... You know, it was all troubled kids yeah. because everybody else kind of actually made fun of him and stuff. He kind of became known for purposely creating a persona that would scare most people in that town. Yeah. This is kind of why he got made fun of. That started with him simply just not doing things that most of us do, like showering. Some people... Delicious. Set, set, yeah. <laughs> Some people said at school he would be called turd boy because he literally, he didn't just smell like B.O., like he didn't shower for a few days or a week. Like he straight up did not shower for months or even up to a year at a time, and he would smell like urine and feces. Um, Dumb question. Even if you're not showering, I don't don't want to ask the rest of that question. (laughs) I'm going to be honest. Yeah. So... I yeah I don't nope. I don't know stepping away from that. that. So, not shocking, he covers himself in tattoos. Really bad tattoos, I might add. I was about to say, really bad tattoos. Covered in tattoos. Yeah, really bad ones. After nine eleven happened, he started wearing, and I apologize if I butcher this because I have tried to listen to the pronunciation multiple times, and then I go to say it on my own and i keep messing it up you have the white girl accent (laughs) yeah um i believe it's pronounced kafia okay so anybody who doesn't know what that is you know you've seen it we've all seen it it's the head coverings that arab men wear so it's like the one that's long and then it looks like almost like they wrap like a rope around the top of their head to okay hold it yeah, on. Yeah, yeah it's that type of head covering so he began wearing that after 9 11 just to scare people yeah she she has no words <laughs> and that um is, and he wasn't on a watch list no well no because he's like blonde hair blue eyed like oh lovely. he doesn't and his name's john lawson until that's right around the time that he also changes his name to pazuzu algarad do you know why he got to that name yes okay. sort of <laughs> so pazuzu is the name of the demon from the Exorcist movies. I didn't know that. And I read a few different things about the name Algarard, but so it's Arabic. It may mean something to the effect of like announcing. It's it's something like religious based, yeah. I'm guessing, because I saw a few different explanations for it but oh he's so deep and edgy and he later tells investigators it's a lord's name because he tells the the cop says what does that mean (laughs) and he says it's a lord's name so oh my gosh clearly yeah somebody needs to curb stomp this guy he needs he needs to be humbled real quick yeah no that doesn't happen for quite some time who are you to Just straight up appropriate somebody else's whole religion. Yeah. And then also, in addition to that, disrespect it by adding the name of an exorcist demon to yourself. So we'll get into the whole religion thing. Oh, great. Yeah. Give me one second. What's annoying is that I really love the exorcist franchise. (laughs) Like, I love the exorcist and I love the conjuring and I think that they're great. Oh, the conjuring. She doesn't like The Conjuring. I do, but I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It truly, like, out of all the scary movies I've watched, that one terrified the me. The original more than Conjuring, any. like the first one? Yeah. Oh, so I good. haven't even seen the subsequent because. Oh. No, thank you. So good. I didn't sleep for days. No, thank you. It's so good. Listen, I can sleep like a baby after true crime. Yeah. Not after anything having to do with demons or. The only thing I couldn't sleep after is israel keys have i yeah i think i've talked about that <laughs> like camping that like, I, I had like done a deep dive into israel keys and then we went camping <laughs> and 
<laughs> the whole night. I kept popping up going, he's going to get us. He's going to get us. And Nicholas was like, go back to sleep. It's fine. And it rolled over. And I'm like, I hear footsteps. It's Israel. He's like, he's dead, Savannah. I'm like, no, he's coming for us. <laughs> I have never been more scared in my life than that night. And yeah. he's dead. <laughs> like, Maybe his ghost is coming for you. Don't say that to me. <laughs> Sorry. He's not. No, it's he's good. not. It's good. All right. So picture if you will <laughs> i'm picturing this kid lives with his mom and stepdad at that time like through his high school years his mom had remarried they live in a nice suburban home by all accounts it was clean taken well taken care of at some point when he was in his late late teens or very early 20s he basically tells his mom you have to choose between me and your husband so she makes her husband move out okay and basically pazuzu takes over the whole house and trashes it like absolutely trashes it so his house became the place for anyone with a dark side to go and party They referred to their circle of friends. He referred to the circle of friends as the family. Yes, just like Charlie Manson. Oh, come on. Pazuzu had several girlfriends he called fiancés, including Dixie, Crystal, and Amber. Those names come into play. There's a lot of people involved in this whole thing, so I'll do my best to, like, remind you who is who. Need a whiteboard. Yeah, we need... A murder board. A murder board. Yes. So Amber, though, Amber was like his number one. And eventually they they refer to her as his wife, even though legally I don't think they ever got married. So he and his family had essentially taken over the whole house, leaving his mother, Cynthia, just to her bedroom. Like, so her bedroom looks like a normal, relatively clean living situation the rest of the house is there are no words to describe how bad it is really are there pictures there are there's pictures there's footage from when they do the search of the house like once everything kind of they get caught yada yada so you guys can see that on our instagram yes actually i i should have prefaced with this the bulk of what I am going to go over, a lot, like a lot of it, I got from the docu series, "The Devil You Know" on Hulu. It's the first, the whole first season covers this case. Okay. And the reason I went with that being my main thing is because I corroborated, you know, like a lot of what they said in like news articles. But the issue with this case is that there's a lot of stuff that slipped through the cracks for a very long time. And so records were sealed until the final defendant, the final ca- trial was over. And then and then they released like the search warrants and certain records. And to this day, like you can't go online and just look up the court records and stuff because it's a small town. Yeah, and it's Forsyth County in North Carolina, so they, you have to go in person to request records. Well, so dang, we should I take had, a road trip. Yeah, <laughs> if I had had more time, but um, from what I gathered, like what this docu series covered, seemed to be the most reasonable and the most legit as far as just making sense like honestly the main news streams really did up the whole devil worshiper kills people blah 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 you know they tend to for sure and especially in a town like that that's it's sensationalized yeah you know and really so i really liked the angle that the docuseries did because they really take it from an angle the the journalist that they worked with at the time that this was all taking place he was running like his own uh news blog if you will yeah called camel city dispatch his name's chad nance 
And he really took it from the angle of, no, this kid needed help. Like, this guy fell through the cracks of society. Mm -hmm. And it's not just one person's fault. It's not devil worshiping his fault. Like, he had major mental health issues and it just kept getting ignored. So, absolutely. I I feel like that's a much more realistic angle than just, oh, he became a devil worshiper and then suddenly people are dead. Like, yep. So, I should have prefaced with that. My apologies. Oh, no, you're good. That's where we are. So, Yes, if you watch that docuseries, they have footage of the house. Horrible, horrible. So, and but I'll do my best here to describe what what you're okay. looking at so I'm, you can try to picture I'm it. I'm closing my eyes and picturing it. So witnesses who spent time there described it as a place where there were no boundaries. People walked around naked. People were having sex and orgies just out with everybody else just kind of hanging out. Um, drinking, obviously, drugs, obviously, music blaring all times, day and night. People were literally urinating or pooping anywhere in the house. In the corner, there were do- there were multiple dogs that lived in the house that didn't get taken outside, that just peed and pooped anywhere. People described it as, like, as soon as you approach the house... It smelled like straight ammonia all the time. Like, before they even opened the door, you could smell it. <laughs> I'm getting the slow blink. Uh, I, I I can't process it fast enough to have a response. Yeah. Those poor dogs. Oh, yeah. That makes me so sad. I didn't put much else about the dogs because it's really sad. Yeah, no, please don't. <laughs> um. Well... There you are. There's there you not- are. <laughs> <laughs> what is there to say what is about there to that? Say? It's awful. And so, like the house didn't. Nobody called the county or like condemned it or one of the many things that falls through the. Because cracks. I don't know about this particular county, but in county, or well, I'll bleep that because I don't want people to know exactly where we live. But <laughs> in our county, you can't do that because you have neighbors and the people near where we live. They will report oh, a you lot of, yeah. in a heartbeat. Yeah. And we've done it. I've done it. I'm like, you can't poop in your yard, neighbor. Somebody poop. <laughs> like, is that a real thing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's what? not a me story. It's uh, it's uh, one of my boyfriend's cousins. I think we call her aunt, but she, I think she's technically his cousin. Yeah. Has a neighbor who, like, they're living out on their front porch. They're living in their yard. They're pooping in the what? ditch. Uh huh. Oh yeah, and there's a big old case. I went through the I went I went through the portal and looked. I was like, oh look at that. There's a there's a case against them because they're trying to obviously get them to like you can't do that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I think we have footage somewhere. We drove past and filmed it. I'll I'll show you. Oh my gosh. Okay. (laughs) Well, to my knowledge, nobody turned them in for the house itself. Which is disturbing on many levels, but you don't know if were people scared or people worried about retaliation because you've got all these things happen, you know, like yeah. the drugs. And I, I lived in a not, you know, I li- I, I come from Ohio in a city that's. Not all your neighbors are nice. Most of our neighbors were lovely and nice and whatever. Um, But, like, I had to call the cops on our neighbors that we did have when we first owned our house. They luckily got divorced and moved out. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Not too long after I called the cops because of a domestic violence thing. They were constantly fighting. And there's just stuff going on. And and until I actually saw with my own eyes them hitting each other i knew that it was probably happening but i didn't call because that's the last thing you want is you're thinking well what if i call and it's not as bad as it sounds and then they're pissed at me and then they retaliate against me and i'm their next door neighbor like what then but as soon as i saw they got in a fight in their driveway and i heard a ruckus over my baby monitor 
Oh, like it was so loud in my daughter's room that I heard it over the baby monitor. And so I went to this one window where I knew I can see into their backyard and their driveway. And I look and um, he was trying to leave. But then they start. Yeah, it just she like spit in his face and then he smacked her around and then she started hitting him back. And I was like, nope. And I knew they had two kids, two relatively young kids. And I look then and the bedroom lights are on upstairs and it's like a school night. Like it has English in the morning. Midnight, I think, roughly. So, yeah, then I'm going to call. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we had crazy. I mean, we've had bad neighbors, but like we'll watch them through the bathroom window just long enough to call the police. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. So why why the police were never called just to report the stuff people people were fighting people were cutting each other like there was talk that people would just like purposely cut each other (laughs) i don't know that's what one guy in the docuseries said i why why would you just go up and cut somebody i don't know because they're all high and partying and a little not not right in the head so i have no idea but it's just yet another thing that fell through the cracks People also witnessed him, Pazuzu, sacrificing animals and rubbing the blood on himself, claiming that he believed it made him stronger, as well as supposedly he and his, quote, wife, Amber, filed their teeth down to points so that their teeth were, like, pointy. Still getting slow points. I I gotta get better at, like, processing quickly because this is audio only you can't see my stupid face as i'm yeah okay it's a lot it's just horrible because those are clearly mental health issues yes like you like this person these people needed help yeah and while i didn't put this in my notes uh i will add that much like also much like from what i recall of the charles manson case like all the All the girls Mm -hmm. that get involved are much younger. So, like, when a lot of this stuff is going on, Pazuzu is already in his, like, late 20s to early 30s. And these girlfriends of his are, like, 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Like, they're legal, barely. But they're too young. But they're young. And Amber's... One of Amber's best friends, former best friends, was actually interviewed in the docuseries. And she basically says, like, she, I mean, she didn't say it like this. This is, these are my words. But basically, she had daddy issues. Yeah. So she got involved with an older guy who took her down a really wrong path. So if there are any 18 or 19 year old girls out there listening... (laughs) Please, uh, don't. Please. If, if a guy names if himself, have, I think that's enough of a red flag. Yeah. If you have, I had daddy issues. If you have daddy issues, go see a therapist. <laughs> don't, don't date a 30-year-old. Go see a therapist. And, and then, I'm not saying all 30-year-old men are bad, but like. Well, I think, yeah, it, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just. This is the vault. Yeah. Okay. Pazuzu was also known for telling most people who came into the house seemingly tall tales about all the people he's hurt. He I killed the man he with would, his thumb. He would talk about Gratitude. killing homeless people and prostitutes. Most of the people say that they just thought he was blowing smoke and then he was full of crap. Yeah. So nobody ever like went to the police and said, this dude's over here saying he killed people like yeah that just lays the foundation gives you a picture of what we're dealing with always here. always say something even if you think somebody's lying about it yeah. they need to be they need to be aware that it's not okay to lie about those things yeah and this is a perfect case of while it's questionable of when the when and how the police dealt with things Part of the police's reasoning for not doing something more sooner is that they're like, well, we can't, 
just get a search warrant based on a couple Crime Stopper tips. But once they had enough people come forward, then they finally Definitely, started taking yeah. it seriously and stepping in and trying to actually do something. So even if you're like, I don't know, this person is saying this, I don't know any details, but just get it on record. Absolutely. With that person's name in the records and then eventually things pile up and they will actually <laughs> look exactly. into it. So that's how that works. Okay, so a lot of the docuseries focuses on this one particular victim, mainly because this is the victim that multiple people knew about. If the police had stepped in sooner, if things had done happen differently with this one victim, then the other victims probably wouldn't have mm -hmm. even met these people. Yeah, exactly. So... His name was Josh Wetzler. He and his um, girlfriend or partner, Stacy Carter, had bought a farm and a horse farm and were doing fairly well, they thought, but they hit hard times in 2007, um, falling behind on their payments like so many people back in 2007, 2008, yeah, right absolutely. before the housing crisis. So the bank foreclosed on their property in 2008 and, of course, it put a strain on their relationship as as well. Josh had turned to selling things like mushrooms and marijuana in an attempt to dig them out of their financial hole. Stacy, of course, did not condone this. And she didn't want it. They had a child together and she didn't want their son being around any of that. So she left and took a job on another farm while Josh moved into his own trailer where he continued to sell those things. And in 2009, he ended up with a felony drug charge because he foolishly had mushrooms delivered to him through the mail. So FYI, guys, if you send any drug or illegal item through the mail, it's an automatic felony. <laughs> it's called the United States Postal Service. It's yeah. a government entity. Yeah. They don't <laughs> like when stupid. you use their service for illegal acts. So. Oh, okay. So his arrest makes, of course, news in a small town. And he not only loses, like, time and money and everything from that he starts losing business in his legitimate day job business yeah. because they're like oh you're a criminal well yeah. we don't want to do any we don't want to have anything to do with him so that pushes him further into destitution and this is kind of the whole perspective of or the angle of that docuseries is that it's really trying to show like while people make bad choices, a lot of people are making bad choices because they're pushed and pushed and pushed. Like, they just feel like they run out of options. Going yeah, from absolutely. there's not a lot of work available, you, you know, it was a town where people didn't have to necessarily go to college to earn a decent living. Oh, now they do. Now they have to get out of that town in order to work. Yada, and the list just goes on and on. And so, while yes, there are people who don't suffer those things that live in that town, it's just trying to bring to light like how this can happen anywhere and it could potentially happen to anyone where you just feel cornered and you start making crappy choices mm -hmm. because you feel like you have no other options. So, now that he's a felon, he's not able, like, People are turning his business away. I think he might have been, like, contracting or something for some. It's difficult. Once you have a felony on your record, it's difficult to get any job. Really. Absolutely. So, and he had to come up with more money uh, to pay his probation. And he didn't have it. 
many options, if any, so he continued to sell drugs. The last time his girlfriend, Stacy, and their son saw Josh was in July of 2009. And at first, Stacy assumed that he cut off contact with them because he was evading law enforcement mm-hmm. um, and didn't want her, their son, involved. So she doesn't report him missing right away because she sure. thinks, oh, he's pro- he owes money and he's probably and he's going to get in trouble because he's on probation and not able to meet all the conditions. Then, that I think is absolutely valid. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have done it either. Then Josh's probation officer called her several times looking for him. So she really assumed, okay, I'm probably right. He's probably evading them. Yes. And she also assumed that because the probation officer is looking for them, that police in general are looking for him. Yeah. So she kind of felt like, so I don't really need to report him missing because they're looking for They got to be looking for him. Yeah. Except they weren't. No, and probation officers are so overloaded. Yeah. They look, but, but they don't, like, do a manhunt kind of search. So when Stacy realized that Josh's family had not heard from him either, months later, and she then contacts them, the police, and realizes, oh, you're not actively searching. Like, you, you yeah. called me, but you're not actively searching for him. She reported him missing um, in February February of 2010, on February 15th. That's seven months after the last time she saw him. But I can absolutely see how she got to this point. Yeah. Because in the meantime, she's still, ha- she's still raising a kid and working. Right. So it's not like her only issue is, you know, she's got to put food on the table and get the laundry done and... Yep. And she and she thought they were looking. Too, yeah, because she's she doing also her best. lost. Like she, at this point, she was working on a farm just to have a place to live. Like yeah. they did not even pay her. They literally, it was you work on this farm for a room, like for yeah. a place to live. So here's the kicker: when she reports him missing, police tell her that they found his car abandoned in a parking lot with the keys in the ignition just after he, the last time she saw him and they never contacted her or his what? family to say uh do you know where this man is because his probation officer is looking for him but we found his car abandoned with the keys in the what? ignition yep they never contacted. they have a car in their impound lot that they're just like oh yeah we don't know what happened apparently what that is crazy. Okay. So no one, oh, I won't say no one, <laughs> I won't say no one knows how Josh ended up uh, at Pazuzu's house, but clearly like his girlfriend or ex-girlfriend Stacy assumes like these are not the people that he normally would have hung with, but because he started selling drugs and whatnot, he ended up in the circle with Pazuzu. Later, Pazuzu's mother will say that Josh was just a friend of Pazuzu's and he would come over and she said, this This I found almost comical given the state of the house because there didn't seem to be a, a real place to sit or lay, hang out, sleep, yeah. do anything normal. Well, there were plenty of places to have sex, so I'm assuming like... <sighs> A mat- yeah. a bare mattress on the floor i don't i ugh. you just have to see the footage <laughs> okay. it's so oh, bad it's so bad if you guys want to see it i'll be posting it to our instagram but i'll definitely make sure to have a cover photo and yeah. and if you don't know in our in our captions i always list what's on each slide so before you start scrolling yeah. be aware um yeah <laughs> yeah so anyway according to Pazuzu's mother, Cynthia, she said that Josh was just a friend and that he would um, often stay over because he didn't have, and like right before he disappeared, he just didn't have any place to go. So he may have even gotten kicked out of the trailer he was living in. Okay. So, facts. Pazuzu was such a kind soul to take him in and let him stay there. In his poop house, Turd Boy grew up to have a turd house. 
Yeah. <laughs> but multiple people would admit after the fact that Pazuzu told them he had killed someone and had the body in the basement. And multiple people were involved in the dismembering and burial of this body. Only one of those people that was sort of not involved, but she was the daughter of somebody that was involved. She just knew something wasn't right. Yeah. So her father had gotten involved and started hanging out with Crystal, one of yes. Pazuzu's uh, fiancés. And he came home one night after going with Crystal abruptly, and he was acting strange and asked her weird questions like, have you ever smelled death before? And that kind of stuff. So she knew something wasn't right. She pressed him, and he admitted something to her. I forget all the details, but he admitted he was involved in this. She went to police, risking her relationship with her father risking her father going to jail, like, all of it. She tried to go to police on August 3rd, so just a little bit after he Josh went missing from family and friends. After that report, because she's a legitimate, like, she... Yeah. She was not one of these people. <laughs> yeah, and to, and, and to the, yeah. you know, to police, those people are quote-unquote less credible. dead. So yeah. to them, she's a credible. Yes. Oh, this one will listen credible. to you, so Which makes me sick, by the way. An officer goes to Pazuzu's house, knocks on the door, and says, just straight up tells him, we've gotten a report of a body buried in your backyard. <laughs> Why would you tell him that? And Pazuzu says... No. <laughs> now he's going to move it. So the officer says, can we take a look around? And Pazuzu says, no. no. <laughs> so they leave. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's uh, so many, seven. so many points. Number one, how dare you? Number two, <laughs> that's Kelly Kapoor for you. Uh, number two, you, now he's going to move said body. No, he doesn't. Oh, he, he doesn't? doesn't? No. <laughs> Why would he? He so thinks he, he's getting it. Like, yeah. He, he tells a friend. He tells one of the one of his friends at some point. I don't know in the timeline when this is. But before he finally gets caught, he tells him, oh, the devil protects me. He thought he was legit oh going to get away with but every like, everything. Here's my thing, everything. though. The police show up and say, we have heard that you have a body in your backyard. And in your head, you're like, I actually do have a body in my backyard. Yep. You'd think maybe I um, should probably move that body because they could go get a warrant and come no. back and then I can't tell them no. But this time it wouldn't be there. But instead... The devil will protect me. I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People are... Yep. I mean, you know what? Clearly, clearly he's not thinking straight. Um, I'm just being too logical, I think. Yeah, there was no logic in any of this. <laughs> None yeah, whatsoever. the logic would be to use the working toilet, but... Yeah. <laughs> None happening Absolutely. there. Absolutely. On September 24th, 2009. So we're just like not quite two months a little less than two months later, August 3rd to September okay, 24th. Thank you. I forgot the date. <laughs> yep. Uh, police receive an anonymous call from a man who claimed that Tazuzu, with a T, shot and buried a man in his backyard. This one, I'm thinking, was probably a neighbor. But they did it anonymously. Okay. No one knows who it is. Well, I'd have been anonymous, too. Police do nothing. Like, there's no record that they really... I'm so frustrated because this is a small town. Yes. So I'm imagining that the police department's not that big. Not really. You're dealing with the sheriff's department for the whole county. Yeah. So somebody has to have made the connection that... Pazuzu and Tazuzu are probably are the, same the same person. I'm guessing there aren't too many people named Pazuzu or, or Tazuzu, Tazuzu in <laughs> North Carolina. <laughs> yes. So yes. somebody had to think, oh, that's two tip lines 
that we've gotten yeah. that said there's a dead body back here. Yeah. Oh, but he wouldn't let us come in, so let's just move on. Yeah. Forward to November of 2009, another two months later. And the last time that Josh was seen was February. July. July. Yeah. So people are turning this in, like, relatively soon after okay. it happened. In November, one of Pazuzu's fiancés, Dixie, contacts her high school boyfriend, Matt Flowers. Oh, that's a good last name. Yeah, I like this guy. Like, he's troubled, but, like, you understand why. Yeah. Like, when you... He's a big part of the docuseries. Okay. So she contacts him. He's He has gone away to the military. He used to hang out with this crowd. But he's gone away to the military okay. because he was thinking, this is going to get me out of here. This is going to get me. Well, unfortunately, he was also traumatized in the military. So well, you know, but I see sucks. where his I see where he was going and I, I get what you're saying. But yes. So she calls him and tells him, I'm part of, quote, the family now. And he's like, uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> and she admits to him that... She helped bury the body in the backyard. She gives him details. And I think she even took pictures and, like, sent pictures. Not of the body, just oh. of the yard and, like, where it's at. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was thinking she, like, was, like, vlogging them dismembering. No, no, no. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, my gosh. I think because he would know, because he'd been there. He had hung out there. Yeah. So he, he would, would know, know where it was. Where that all i'm sure he know. wanted that information well yeah he was pretty freaked out and he said at one point he flew her out he came back to the states um once his deployment was over and wherever he was at that point he flew her to him and he said then she was like a different person so like whatever was going on it was very like brain worshipy like yeah <laughs> like because as soon as she got to him he said she's like a different person like a weight had been lifted off of her and oh, whatever so, so sad. here's the only my only complaint about this docuseries is that you don't know what happened to dixie oh yeah but or is dixie dixie doesn't look like the same person person as crystal but crystal goes down as being a part of this so they may be one person in the same because amber had a nickname of bubbles so maybe Crystal was Dixie? I'm not sure. I don't sure. know. Yeah. I'm not sure. So anybody that uh, watches the docuseries, if you figure that one out, because I watched through it twice and I couldn't figure it out. There's only talk about Dixie at this point. And they show pictures of her. And to me, she doesn't look like the same person as Crystal Matlock, but maybe because the pictures of dixie are like when yeah. she's first kind of hanging out with them so she's young and better looking and whatever and then of course you see crystal matlock and she doesn't look so great because that's after like a lot of this has happened so i get that this whole thing could age somebody and you're not gonna look so great but anyhow so matt flowers then tries calling police in in november of 2009 you think she may have died in a car crash oh that's sad it's hard to tell unless there's another another dixie ross which is very it could happen yeah okay anyway sorry i don't know if that's her maybe 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 that's why they didn't yeah okay well good to know okay so Matt Flowers calls police anonymously because they know who he is. They know who yeah, he is. Yeah, I would too. He's concerned for Dix Dixie because she he just flew her to where he was temporarily. It wasn't like yeah. a living situation. So he's concerned for her well-being. So he just calls anonymously and gives the full report. Yeah. Full report. This is what happened. This is... Here you go. But he doesn't tell them anything about Dixie, and he doesn't give his name. Okay. Smart. Still nothing. Bro. Now, in their defense, in the police department's defense, this is a small town. 
that only sees like two to three homicides a year max. So you're not really dealing, you know. Yeah, but still, like, like I've said, it's a small, it's a small department. All of yeah. this is circulating. Yeah. Somebody has to have said, and, and I'm sure somebody did. But like, why? I just don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, Chief Deputy Brad Stanley, who's interviewed for the docuseries, explains in his interview that tips given through their Crime Stoppers program were not enough to give probable cause for a search warrant. Did they try? Not as far as I could tell. Because I'm wondering if maybe if you had tried between the Crime Stoppers, the general smell of the home... Yeah, just walk up to the door. Like, I, yeah, I don't, I don't get that. Like, you're, the you're at the time, house. Yes, the first time because don't they have the right yes. to search if they there's anything at all that leads them to believe something isn't right? So it's a little more complicated than that, to be fair. But I would say that by if you have reports of a dead body being at a house and you walk up to said house and try to talk to the people and it smells like straight ammonia and death. Wouldn't I that be enough to at least go back to your station and be like, hey. Hey, something ain't right. And we're not seeing any of that. We're not seeing any movement or any no. record from the police of that. No. So that's what's a little concerning because you definitely could have, I don't know. We're just, don't, we don't see the record. So if you don't see it, then we, we have to yeah. assume you didn't try. Right. And they kept all of it sealed until... Everything, Everything was over. Was over, yeah. Yeah. Okay, here's another witness. A witness by the name of Sylvia LeBeau claims that she gave Amber and Pazuzu a ride home one night, and they asked her to come in to show her a home video. She claims that in the video, Pazuzu is wearing a bloody bandana and that their friends told her that the bandana belonged to Josh Wetzler. Oh, no. She says that she was told that they trapped Josh in their basement and starved him for days before shooting him and cutting off his extremities. They then buried him in the backyard. Sylvia states that Pazuzu's girlfriend, Crystal Matlock, openly and proudly told people she knew and was involved. Later, like weeks later, Sylvia goes to a party with a friend from work. And while there... They start talking, and she, for whatever reason, the conversation took a turn, and she starts talking about that experience at Pazuzu's house. The friend is, like, shocked. Not just shocked because it's a horrific story, but shocked and tells her, you need to meet my friend, Stacy. Stacy Carter, the girlfriend oh, of Josh gosh. Wetzler. Okay. It's a small world. So they come up with a plan for Sylvia to go back to Pazuzu's house and try to get a recording of, of them anybody saying. at the house trying to talk about it. Sylvia goes back, but unfortunately, the recording isn't clear enough to like oh. hear the people. Like you can hear her clearly asking questions, but you can't hear. Yeah, it's not clear enough. So but she they're trying. Yeah, she wanted to be able to take that to police, but she she couldn't really get much from that and she said she she said she did go to the police, but because the recording wasn't clear, she wasn't taken very seriously. But again, I question, how do you not take that seriously when multiple people who like, are not connected, none of these people bro. know each other. So they, it's not like there's some big conspiracy yeah, against him. Or they're just, it's just rumors. Like, no. Yeah. So. And this guy is missing. Yes. At this point, they've put Stacy and, and Josh. You know, and you know. Yes. Who this is. Yes. So. You have his car in your impound lot. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. Yeah. This, is why, this is why I got so sucked into this. Like, what is happening? How is this happening? I'm so mad. I'm so angry. So Sylvia's work friend, then she goes back to the friend and is like, hey, I tried. I tried to get the recording. It didn't work. I tried to go to police. It didn't work. So she takes her to meet Stacy. And Sylvia tells Stacy 
this is what I know. I think you, I think your ex-boyfriend, yeah. I think the father of your son might be buried in that backyard. And no matter how it ended, that has to be such a hard conversation to hear. Oh, absolutely. Because at some point in her life she cared so much about this person oh she's still in love and with they him. never it wasn't like Even a bad ending it was just these, because of her yeah, son right it and, was because of the son and drugs and she loved him she says in her in the oh docuseries she's she continues like to fight for him years later like she shows up at the trials she yeah that's so she's hard. like he is the love oh my of my gosh. life i didn't leave him because i stopped loving him i left him because he was making bad choices that i yeah, couldn't absolutely. raise my son in absolutely oh my gosh the poor thing that's so hard so sylvia tells stacy everything stacy then contacts police and says you know you're gonna think this is crazy probably but i believe that my son my the son of my ugh, I can't talk today. The father of my son, <laughs> there it is, has been killed and is buried in this man's yard. Yeah. And I have no idea how he even knew this guy. I don't, like, but I know he's been missing and I know he wouldn't continue being missing. And now these people are telling yeah. me this. So a week later, on February 23rd, 2010, police execute a search warrant and tell Stacy. They searched the backyard with cadaver dogs, but they were unable to find any evidence of a crime. They told her that. They told her that. So you're indicating to me that that's not but, what actually happened. Yeah, keep keep that in mind for later. I'll tuck we're that into keep, my pocket. Yeah, tuck that in. We're gonna we're gonna touch on that again later. So, um, again, let me reiterate again how important this is. Even after that search, they keep the records sealed. So that that's what they tell her, but she has no way to confirm that. Yeah, to check. Okay. So now might be a good time to to kind of take a break. Okay. So my next thought was that's what makes me like the only only thing I like about Florida, especially the court system, is that we have the Sunshine State Law where all of this whole being sealed crap would not happen here. Yeah. All of it is public. You can find it all. If you don't know, that's why we have the Florida man saga of everything. So crazy <laughs> comes from Florida. It's not that Florida is inherently crazier. It's that everything is public record. Yeah. And it's, it's much easier, easier for to journalists to find things. Yes. So that's why this is all shocking to me because I, I think it's bonkers. It is. It, I mean, it is. It absolutely is. It is bonkers. Good time to take a break. Absolutely. All right. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. It won't be you next won't, time. Yeah, you won't have to wait a whole week for it. Yeah, we're thinking we're going to release it kind of halfway. Sorry, I'm hitting my <laughs> microphone again. I'm so worked up. I'm so angry. Um, so we're thinking this will come out, like the first part will come out on Thursday, and then probably part two will come out on Wednesday. If anything changes, check our social media pages. Wednesday? I thought we said Monday. I meant Monday. We don't know. Let's, it's going to come out before. You won't have to wait a whole yeah, week. Yeah. Let me backtrack. <laughs> That's all we know. <laughs> It'll come out. on The first part will come out on Thursday. Part two will come out on Monday. Yeah. If anything changes, likely. check social media. But I doubt that anything will change. Yeah. All right. Stay tuned, guys. I got to go eat a snack and come right back. Thank you. Because you got to finish it. Bye. Right, bye. Thanks for listening, guys. Find us on Instagram and TikTok at Burden of Proof Pod and email us at burdenofproofpod at gmail.com.